This video covers the higher level content from B2.3 on cell specialization. Now we know that surface area to volume affects how quickly cells can get materials into and out of their cells. In tissues where there needs to be a rapid exchange of materials, cells must have a large surface area to volume ratio. And so what we'll find is that cells have unique shapes and adaptations in places where this is really important. Two examples to highlight here, one which is a red blood cell. So red blood cells are small, and that means that they automatically have a relatively high surface area to volume ratio, but they also have kind of this like flattened concave shape, I'm drawing this from the side, that again allows for a lot more surface area. The proximal convoluted tubule cells, these are found in the nephron of the kidney. So if you haven't already studied that, this may sound a little intimidating, but what we need to know there from now is that they have to be very good at absorbing things, okay? And absorbing things means, A, you need like room to do that membrane space, but also they're going to need membrane proteins, like channel proteins and protein pumps, and those are embedded in the membrane. So they're going to have little um, kind of like protrusions like this. These are called microvilli. And what microvilli do is they increase the surface area for absorption. And that surface area, that membrane is what contains all of the proteins, you know, necessary for transport of things like ions and glucose. So great adaptations there to help increase that surface area to volume ratio. Another great example of this concept of surface area to volume ratio can be found in our lung tissue. So our lung tissue, and well, there's like a lot of different types of tissues in lungs, but we have a couple of cell types down here in these sacs called alveoli. So if I think about where is the air going, if you haven't already studied gas exchange yet, so air comes in through the mouth or the nose, down through the trachea, and then it branches into bronchi, which branches into bronchioles and ends in these little air sacs called alveoli. I've zoomed in on one of them here. These alveoli are made up of two cells and these cells are called pneumocytes. Site means cell. Pneumo refers to the lungs, like kind of like thinking about pneumonia, and there are two cells. So all outline um, type one pneumocytes here in blue. Look at these cells, they are flat, okay. This flattened shape and this very thin shape increases the surface area to volume ratio. So these guys have an incredibly high surface area to volume ratio, and that's because that's where gas exchange is taking place. It's where the diffusion of gases happens. And we know that's more efficient when the surface area to volume ratio um, is very high. We're gonna see relatively few mitochondria in there because we don't need a lot of ATP for active transport. Remember, diffusion is a passive process. We're also going to find a different type of pneumocyte. These type two pneumocytes, they look like this. They're more cuboidal in shape. So they have a relatively low surface area to volume ratio, but that's okay because they're not used for transport. They're not used for getting gases to diffuse into or out of the alveoli or the bloodstream. They're there to produce what's called a surfactant. And a surfactant keeps these alveoli from collapsing in on each other, but also provides moisture for more efficient diffusion. There are lots of organelles in there. And again, this is covered in more detail in a different topic. But since we're in this um, bit here on cell specialization and form and function, it's important to recognize that these two types of cells have entirely different types of shape because they have different functions within the alveoli of our lungs.
Now let's take a look at another example. This comes from a different system, from our skeletal muscle system. And we'll start with talking about these striated muscle fibers. Striated means striped, and they look striped on micrograph um, pictures. And the reason is because they are separated into these units called sarcomeres. Again, that's from a different topic. This is about form and function. So what's the form? What's the function? Well, they are very long. They, so one muscle fiber will span the entire length of a muscle. And when they're um, contracted, they can shorten um, quite a bit to create a very strong pulling force. They are multinucleated, um, so they have a lot of nuclei. Again, it helps with like efficient transmission of um, messaging. More on that in another topic. And again, that striation comes from the stripes, those repeating units of contractile um, units. All right, and then we have cardiac muscle cells. So these have some similarities to the striated muscle cells that we find in our skeletal muscles, except they're not multinucleated. They're only one nucleus, and that's really okay because they're much shorter, so they don't need those multiple nuclei. They are, however, branched, and those branches are um, connected through features called intercalated discs. This is because it's very important for cardiac muscle cells to contract in unison, to be coordinated. And so that structure very much helps their function. The egg and the sperm are also great examples of cells that have very specific adaptations um, or structures for their unique functions. So we'll start out by drawing the sperm first. And I'm going to start by just drawing this head area, okay? And the head is going to narrow into this like mid-piece type area, which is then going to narrow even further into this tail or flagella. Okay, not a great drawing. I'm hoping yours looks a little bit better here. Now, this sperm has several features which are very important. So it does have this flagella, and that is for movement. Inside of the midpiece, it's going to have several helical mitochondria. Okay, so these are helical mitochondria. All right, and then let's see, inside of this head region, it's going to have um, two very important things. So it is going to have a haploid nucleus, and in this like almost like nose type area is how I think of it, um, this is a structure called the acrosome. And this is all surrounded by the plasma membrane of the sperm, okay? So the plasma membrane would go all the way around the outside, not just up here on the front, but all the way around. There are lots of other features, and you may see them in like a textbook about like microtubules and proteins, and those are important too, but here we'll focus on the main bits. So this flagella, um, or tail, if you wanna call it that, um, is there for movement, okay? So for like a swimming action. That, as you can imagine, is going to require lots of energy. So these helical mitochondria become very helpful in that regard. The haploid nucleus doesn't necessarily have a huge function in terms of like, I don't know, a specialized shape, but it does contain the chromosomes, which will fuse with the chromosomes of the egg upon fertilization. Now, this acrosome contains tons of enzymes. That's the key word here, enzymes. And those enzymes are going to help like eat through the outer layer of the egg, more on that in just a moment, to help that sperm reach the cell membrane or the plasma membrane of the egg. And then this plasma membrane, I'm gonna leave that in black, um, has binding proteins, and these binding proteins are going to match up with proteins on the egg's cell membrane to help them fuse together. So great example here of form and function. Now let's talk about some features of the egg and how it helps perform its function. So the egg is comprised of several layers. So I'm gonna start out with the main part of the egg, which is surrounded by the plasma membrane. 
Inside the egg, we're going to have a haploid nucleus, just like the sperm, that contains the chromosomes. And a, uh, it's going to be filled with cytoplasm. And that cytoplasm is going to have all the normal things, like organelles, but it will also have yolk, which is what um, the fertilized egg or the zygote would use for energy. It will also have these things that look like dots. Um, they're actually quite large. They're visible on a microscope. These are called cortical granules. Okay. And then I'm going to find two kind of things surrounding the egg. There's this layer of follicle cells called the corona radiata. So leftover follicle cells after ovulation, corona kind of meaning crown radiata going out like this. And then I have that space in between the follicle cells and the egg, and that is called the zona pellucida. All right, so I've color coded a few of them. I left the plasma membrane black, um, same with the cortical membrane or cortical granules and the cytoplasm. So let's have a quick chat about what these different features help the egg to do. So we'll start with some that might be a little bit more obvious, right? So the haploid nucleus contains the chromosomes that will fuse with the chromosomes of the sperm upon fertilization. Okay, the cytoplasm or yolk contains energy. And this corona radiata is just serving as this outer layer here. It's one of the things that the sperm will have to pass through in order to fertilize the egg. Now, this plasma membrane, much like the sperm, has binding proteins. Again, those are going to help match up with the binding proteins on the sperm, ensuring that fusion takes place. And so once that fusion takes place, once one sperm fuses with the plasma membrane of the egg, the egg is going to release these cortical granules. So they'll move from the um, cell into this zona pellucida. And that is going to cause the zona pellucida. I say hardens, it's because we haven't really, a, it's not really a topic for B2.3, but it makes it impenetrable so that no more sperm can get to the egg and fertilize the egg. So again, if you haven't studied the ins and outs of reproduction yet, that is okay. The important part here is understanding that the egg and the sperm are both examples of specialized cells that have different features because they have different functions.